morning. How are those money makers doing today? We are on week number four of this 10 week program. And today we have one of your favorites, Ellen Yin, that's gonna walk us through financial statements and more from a, a perspective of how she uses them, what is useful to her, what has worked in the past, on week four of what your statements are telling you. Statements can be a little bit intimidating, but if you find out, like Robert said last week, um, the story that is telling about your business, then that's gonna change the tone in which you are looking into them. So remember that this session is being recorded, the breakout sessions are not. And if you stayed in the breakout session in the main room, when we break out into the rooms, um, we always pause the recording, so that's always a private safe space for you guys to share your experience or ask your questions that you have. Today, our agenda is a little bit different. Uh, we're currently on the welcome. We're going to have the sponsor highlight. I hope that Mike is over here. I didn't check if he already connected. Uh, then we have a graduate highlight and then the fireside chat with Ellen, the breakout session, and the Q&A. Uh, this program is funded by the EDA and by all of the cities, counties, government agencies, nonprofits, our foundations that support our mission. Now, let's see, I, I need to check here on the participants. Mike Webb, are you around here? <laughs> he, he just joined. Excellent. So um, as you guys know, we have a sponsor and it is Oregon Pacific Bank. And what we've been doing is we've been talking um, with their uh, staff and they're coming in on each session to answer a question or give us some tips in regards to reaching out to a financial institution for financing. So today, Mike is going to answer why, oh why, do they ask for financial statements when a business applies for a loan? So with that, I I'll welcome Mike. Thanks, Honey. I appreciate it. Uh, we just ask because we want to pry, but be, to be serious, we want to be able to measure your ability to repay. So a bank has to do something what they would call safe and sound lending. We have to see that or pay attention to whether a loan can be repaid from what we're lending for. So the, the intent is to measure financially based upon your history and predict your ability to pay in the future. And that's the, the basis of it. Um, often startups don't have a good history of financial information because they're, they're brand new. So we end up relying upon uh, projected information as best we can or historic past performance in similar industries to try to make things work. But uh, the best information you can get us is uh, tax returns, typically three years of tax returns, anything that shows your current uh, income capacity or cash flow. If you have a profit and loss statement for your business and a balance sheet, that's real helpful. Uh, if a CPA is involved, we often work with them and, and with some back and forth and they will provide the information for us. But the real reason we want to do it is so that we can measure that you can repay the loan and... Um, or at least we expect that you can repay the loan based upon what the business is doing. So that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so just as a reminder, Mike works in the Florence branch and he's the VP or commercial relationship manager. And Mike, if you would like to stay around for a little bit in case people have any questions. Actually, we do have one. How does lending work for people who can't provide three years of tax returns? It, I would ask you to what you can provide. So we'll take as much information as we can get. Uh, three years is typical. Some, sometimes three years doesn't relate to three years in this business. It might be maybe the, you were working as a W-2 earner with uh, another institution, but we try to tie everything together and just show that you have a history of earning potential. So do the best you can, but uh, open the door with the bank. The banks are, are here to help. We're here to, to talk to you and, and give you some guidance as to what you need to do in order to become bankable. Often a startup business isn't real bankable right off the, the beginning because it's a little bit too risky, 
but we can give you some guidance as to what it would take to get over that hump. And when you get one or two years into the business, what it would take to become truly bankable and qualifying for better rate loans, lines of credit and that kind of thing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So well, if you're able to stay for a little bit, maybe people will have some questions in the chat. That would be great. Okay. Um, right now, I we're going to change gears here and I'm going to share my screen once again because I want to share a win, essentially. Um, you guys might remember Aaron Sewell. He was in our Rainmaker program and he recently launched his crowdfunding campaign for um, a kit that um, it's spill proof and where you can have your foods and your things when you go camping, but also in your day-to-day -day life. And he has already reached his goal. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. He, he shared with us that most of the footage on the video, he actually did it on his iPhone. And he had a, a help uh, from, from his friend who helped with the ed editing of all of it. He also worked with a marketing company that specializes in crowdfunding campaigns, and that really helped a lot. He had a um, failed crowdfunding campaign about a year prior to joining Rainmaker. So I just wanted to share this with you, highlight that because we should celebrate these wins. And also whenever you fall, you can stand up again, get the right help and be able to move forward. So congratulations to Aaron, even though he's not here today. Um, this is awesome. Okay, so now. Aaron, do you know, uh, sorry, Ani, do you know how much he raised? Yes, yeah, so his goal was 10,000 and I just checked and he's above that goal. Uh, right now he's about an 11,000. Okay. Yes. All right, so to, we are right here um, on what your statements are telling you with Ellen Yin in this 10 week program. And here are all of our moneymaker speakers. They're in order, so you guys can see uh, the we're, we're in the process of choosing our keynote speaker for graduation, so stay tuned for that. And I know some of you have been asking questions about the pitch. Um, we'll be providing that in the next couple of weeks. It is not the same pitch as we did on Rainmaker. This is gonna be a little bit different because it's more oriented towards money matters. Um, so we'll be talking to you guys about that soon. And here are your cohort leads. You are automatically placed on your cohorts. So do not worry about what number you should be remembering. The only ones I need to remember that are these guys over here, <laughs> but they're good too, because that's also, um, they're also gonna be placed there automatically. So there is no mentor hour this week. And the mentor hour for next week is going to be the above week. So we're going to have two weeks of no mentor hours and then one week where we'll have one mentor hour, one main session and another mentor hour. So just be prepared for that. Um, all right. So now we are going into our um, speaker for the day. And it is Ellen Yin. Ellen is the founder of Cubicle to CEO and a co-working uh, space up in Salem called The Clubhouse. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen over here and I will tell you a little bit more about Ellen. All right, so she's the founder and podcast host of Cubicle to CEO, a media company creating financially transparent content, events, and education, empowering women entrepreneurs to pursue what's possible and what's not too. Ellen quit her corporate job without a backup plan, and she bootstrapped her first $300 client and made it into a $2 million in revenue by the age of 28. Um, through her online programs, she has mentored over 10,000 students, and her work has been featured in Forbes, The Today Show, Yahoo Finance, Her Money, Statesman Journal, Blogger, Real Simple Magazine, Thrive Global, and more. So uh, Ellen has a plethora of knowledge that, that you know, it's, she really shares in a very authentic and way. So we're very excited to have her here. And with that, I, I don't have anything else to say except that we're so glad that you're here. 
Thank you, Ani. I always, always look forward to being here with you guys. I've been a speaker at two other um, Rain hosted events before, and it's you guys are just always the best group. So thrilled to be here. All right. So should we get started with with some questions over here? Okay. Let's so do let's it. do the first question. What do you look for in your financial statements that allows you to have a clear picture and make sound decisions for your business? Great question. So I took some notes. So if I'm looking down, it's just to help me stay on track and give you guys the most value. Um, first, I, I want to give a quick disclaimer that maybe unlike some of the other speakers that are coming into this, um, this session, I'm not, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a bookkeeper or a financial consultant, but this is my experience from running a business over the last five years. So I just want to make that clear in the pre-frame, but the three things that I, um, well, the three basic things that any business owner really should be looking at, I believe at least on a monthly basis, um, are of course your revenue or your total income, total sales, whatever you want to call that your expenses and your profit. So those three metrics for sure. But let's dive a little bit deeper into, um, you know, some of those details. So with expenses, I think, uh, it's important to be tracking that obviously through your books, but I like to look at five specific categories when I'm reading my statements to get a sense of my financial health in the business, where we're going, how different investments or levers that we're pulling are, paying off for us. So the five categories that I would encourage you to look at next time you're reading through your expenses is what are you spending on labor on a monthly basis? So labor includes any employees, anyone that's on payroll, as well as independent contractors that you hire. So 1099 contractors. Also, I want you to look at advertising and marketing spend. So how much are you spending on anything in the area of promoting your business? Those two categories, by the way, labor and advertising and marketing make up the majority of our expenses as a business, um, over 50%, which I'll get into a little bit more later. And then the third category I look at when it comes to expenses um, are my fixed overhead. So fixed overhead being things like uh, rent, insurance, softwares, utilities, anything that on a monthly basis stays pretty consistent for you in your business. And then the fourth category is variable overheads. So variable overheads are things that change on a month to month basis, depending on maybe what promotions or launches or projects you have going on in your business. And they can include things like shipping, uh, credit card processing fees, bank processing fees, gifts that you may give to clients, any interest that you're paying on things, uh, subscriptions, legal or professional fees. So if you're working with an accountant, for example, or maybe you hire an attorney for something specific to draft, draft up a contract, that would all fall under variable overheads. And again, that's not an all-inclusive list, but just to kind of give you an idea of what each of those things are. And then the fifth category I look at in my expenses um, are business development. And I'm so glad that you guys are all here today because I think that it really shows that you value professional and personal development. And that is such an important thing to continually invest in. I've invested in personal development since day one in my business. And I really believe it's made such a huge difference in the trajectory and momentum that we've had over the last five years. So business development can include things like training, uh, continuing education. So if you're buying online courses or programs, those count. Um, anytime you travel, uh, you know, your business meals while you're traveling. Those are all um, great examples of business development expenses. Okay. I'm going to stop real quick there just to see if there's anything on that you want to jump in before I keep going. Cause I know that was a lot. Well, I don't think any, anything on the chat. I do think this is a really good breakdown of things to look for and presented in a way that we can all understand. Uh, one more time, the five things. Can, yeah. you, can you repeat that list, please? Of course, Rochelle, no problem. So um, the five main categories of expenses um, that I look at are labor, advertising and marketing, 
fixed overheads, variable overheads, and business development. So those are the five expense categories. But overall in your business, when you're looking at your business statements on a month to month, quarterly or annual basis, you should also be looking at total revenue and sales, total expenses, and then total profit, um, which I have a few other notes on those things that I look at. So like I mentioned, the first two expense categories that I mentioned, labor and advertising and marketing are the biggest expenses in our business. So I looked and on average, we spend about 35% of our total revenue as a business on labor. So again, that's employees and contractors. And then we spend anywhere, I would say from 20 to 25% of our total revenue on advertising and marketing. Now, the reason this is important is because um, this is something that my finance team taught me and it really changed the game for how I look at my business finances. Basically, they taught me that every type of business has their own version of what they call a perfect PL. So a PL is, you know, just finance speak for profit and loss statements. So exactly what I was just talking about, a profit and loss statement shows how much money you made total in your business, what your expenses were, and then what your profit was after all expenses are accounted for. And for different types of business models, there's a different percentage split. So if you think about all the money that comes into your business as 100% of the pie, how are you splitting up that pie into those different expense categories? And that ratio might look different for different types of businesses. So for myself, because I am primarily an online business and specifically an online business that specializes in the online education space, so selling digital products, um, my perfect PL looks like what I just said about 35% on labor, 25% on marketing, the rest of that in the other categories of expenses. And then what we try to shoot for as a company each month is a 30% profit margin before taxes, pre-tax profit of 30%. So I tell you this, not because I want you to you know, run to your books after this and go, okay, I need to be making 30% profit pre-tax. That, that may or may not be true depending on your specific business model and your priorities. Um, but I think it's important that you understand what you're aiming for each month in those different categories. And then of course, over time as well. So you can reflect and say, okay, am I way overspending in one category? And if so, what is the purpose behind that? How is that affecting my business? It just gives you some tangible metrics to look at and compare performance for over time. Um, one last thing I'll share here before Ani, I'm sure asked the next question is, uh, this is another big takeaway that I've had over my years as a business owner. Oftentimes I think profit margin can be something that for lack of a better term, it's like it, you know how, when people, um, talk about their gross sales in a business or their gross revenue, right? They, people may look at that and go, oh yeah, that's great that your company made a million dollars or whatever it is, but how much did you actually get to keep? Like, what was your profit? Like if you spent a million to make a million, is that really, is that really a success? Right. And because of that, I think a lot of business owners have in their head that profit margins alone speak to the health of their business. And we can become overly attached to what that profit says about our success as entrepreneurs or as business owners. So I just want to remind you all that profits are typically, in, in my opinion, as a non-financial expert, but just as an everyday entrepreneur like you, profit margins are a reflection of your priorities in a moment in time. So what I mean by this is, yes, in a general sense, we, we try to shoot for 30% profit margins in our business because of, you know, we know that that's going to be what creates sustainable growth for us. But that doesn't mean that if there is a month or a quarter where our profit margins fall below that, that I immediately assume, oh no, like everything is going to crap. We're not doing well because you have to look at, okay, the more you reinvest back into your business, like if there is a specific quarter, let's say where you hired a new team member, right? That costs money to onboard a new team member, to train them. Um, maybe legal fees were associated with that. 
or if you had a month where you had a big launch, so you spent a bunch of extra money on advertising. Those are things that may not have an immediate return on investment, but they matter to the long-term growth of your business. So just because you reinvested more back into your business and your profit margins are smaller as a direct result of that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't have success in that moment in time. It's just a reflection of your priorities and how aggressive you want to spend in your business in that particular season. I hope that helps. Wonderful. Thank you. We have a lot of questions coming in. I'm copying them all, you guys, so don't worry about it. We're going to ask them all. Um, this is great information over here. Um, so let's see. Second question. What are three things that you have done that have worked really well to increase your revenue? So three things that we have done in our business is one, um, creating scalable products. So I think this one, no matter what type of industry you're in, it's important to think about what is at least one arm of my business where the potential for revenue is not limited directly by finite resources, like the hours in a day that a person can do something, right? So for us in our particular business model, it that looks like digital products for us. That looks like templates and courses and things that I can invest money, time, and energy in creating one time and then sell to infinity without incurring um, a bunch of additional expenses, right? So um, for example, um, back in late 2019, early 2020, I created a $27 digital product that has brought in over its lifetime in the last two-ish years. And we stopped selling it like almost a year ago. So it's, it brought in $318,000 and that's from a $27 product, right? That I created one time. And so keep in mind that scalability is something that's really important and it may not apply to every aspect of your business, especially if you have like an in-person service, you may not be able to make that infinitely scalable without hiring, you know, a huge team, but think about, think outside the box and get creative and ask yourself, what is one thing in my business that I could make more scalable so that if I sell more of it, it doesn't necessarily mean my expenses go up, you know, at the same ratio. Um, number two is we have also set up recurring revenue streams that are passive. This one has been an absolute game changer for us because recurring revenue, as you know, kind of gives you a baseline so that you know, no matter what, even if I don't do anything this month, my business is going to for sure bring in X amount of dollars. And that is, this is a slow long-term growth strategy, right? You're not going to have this you know, set up or built up overnight, but it's absolutely worth your investment in the long term. So the way that we do this is actually through affiliate marketing. And honestly, anybody in any industry and in any business model type can leverage affiliate marketing to their advantage. Because if you think about it, whatever industry you exist in, there are people who are seeking content about the thing that you do, right? So even if you're like, let's say a landscaping company, right? There are people out there on a daily, weekly, monthly basis who are searching for things like, how do I, like, what is the best lawnmower at, at uh, Lowe's or like, you know, what type of mulch should I use in this versus that or backyard renovations before and after people are constantly seeking content about whatever industry that you are in. And if you can capitalize on that by creating quality evergreen content, meaning content that you create one time about, you know, a specific topic or answering a common question that, you know, people are Googling. And then let's say, let's go back to that example that I just gave. Let's say you did a comparison post on the top three lawnmowers that get sold at Home Depot or Lowe's because you're a landscaping company and you compare and contrast and this, you give a recommendation at the end of the blog. And let's say that link ties to an affiliate link so that if someone clicks on that and purchases their lawnmower from Lowe's or Home Depot or Amazon or wherever they purchase, you get a small kickback for that. And you spend the time to create that content one time, but it's paying you over and over and over again, every single time someone um, 
every single time someone comes across that post and makes a purchase. And same idea for, especially if you're in an online business, if you can do affiliate marketing with any sort of uh, softwares or subscriptions that you already use, those are some of my favorite affiliate partnerships because you get recurring income. So every time someone pays their monthly dues for that subscription, you get a percentage of that fee. So that's another thing that we've done. Um, that we bill up to, it's not very big, but we bill up to $6,000 a month now in recurring revenue, completely passively. Meaning if I did absolutely nothing, that 6K I know is coming into my business on a monthly basis. And that is set to be around 10 to 12,000 in the next six to 12 months. So just showing you what is potential uh, for you in, in that area. And then the third thing, and this I think is, a oh, yes. Can I ask you a question that's completely related to where you were just talking? Yes, about please, about? please, please. So somebody here was turned down by Home Depot because they didn't have enough traffic. So how much mm. traffic do you need in order to start something like that? Rochelle, that's a great question. So I don't know the individual requirements of different companies, but here's the cool thing. Amazon affiliates doesn't matter what your traffic is. Um, their Amazon influencer program is different, but the Amazon affiliate program, anybody can sign up for. And guess what? Pretty much every product on the planet earth is sold on Amazon. So even if Home Depot itself was like, no, you can't be an affiliate for us, their products that they sell in their store, I guarantee you there's either the same or very similar products on Amazon. So you could, you could sign up through that and, and use those affiliate links instead. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Okay. The last thing um, that we've done to grow our revenue, and I think this is actually the most important thing, and it will be directly tied into our breakout activity today, is to simplify your offers. Um, we have this myth, especially beginning entrepreneurs, I think have a myth that the more offers or the more products, the more services you have available for sale, the more money you will make. Nine times out of 10, the complete opposite is true. Um, there's a lot of really interesting data around this. For example, like Harvard Business Review released a report that multiple studies show that as the number of offers increases, your total sales typically decrease and your overall customer satisfaction also decreases. So it's actually an inverse relationship, which is really interesting to me. Um, but beyond that, you have to think about every single offer in your business has its own ecosystem. That's what I call it, right? So every offer you sell, you have to create a unique marketing strategy for it, a unique sales process for it. Like how is someone actually going to buy this and a unique fulfillment process? Like once someone buys this product or service, how are you actually going to deliver on the thing that they bought from you? So and then beyond that, you also have to have a customer service solution for each offer that you sell, right? Because inevitably, as we run a business, there may come, uh, problems may arise. And so if you think about it, every single offer you're putting out into the world has four unique things that you need to think about in its ecosystem. So if you're even selling five offers, you might be thinking, oh, well, that's only five options that I have. But in reality, you are juggling 20 different moving parts, right? Because you have five offers times four different things for each offer. And that's a lot to juggle, especially if you're a solopreneur and especially if you have limited resources because your business is not at a sustainable um, revenue uh, you know, tier yet. So that's just something I would think about is simplifying your offers to your best sellers. The 80-20 rule tells us that 80% of our results or 80% of our sales come from typically 20% of the things we actually offer. So being able to identify what your winners are and how to amplify them are going to be a huge game changer for the growth of your business. Wonderful. All right. Uh-huh. And then let's do this one and we'll go to the chat. Uh, what is a mindset change that you made that has helped you have better finances in your business? Mm. Oh my goodness. There's so many things. <laughs> this one was a really hard question to answer because there really is, are so many things. I think most importantly though, is to realize that most of us growing up did not receive a lot of financial literacy education, right? 
our school systems don't really teach it unless your parents like actively invested in you in this way. It's, it's likely that we all start at a pretty low level of financial literacy. So I think what's really important is to understand that as an entrepreneur and as a leader of your business, it is your job and your responsibility to raise your own financial IQ and making that a priority. And that doesn't mean become an expert in tax law or get an accounting certification or any of that, but it means that you need to understand the numbers in your business, at least on a high level, so you can track progress and also be able to identify opportunities for growth. So some of the things that we talked about today, that's a great start. Just even tracking your numbers to begin with and looking at it, not being afraid of it, um, is, is a huge step forward in that area. And one other big mindset shift for me is that I really think, you know, what makes numbers scary for a lot of people is that we attach meaning to numbers. We assign um, whether it's our own money beliefs or money stories um, or our own feelings about, you know, hey, if if I set this revenue goal and I didn't hit it, or if my profits fell this this quarter or whatever it is, we attach a meaning to that and we make that say something about ourselves. Like, oh, I didn't hit that goal, therefore I'm a failure. But I think what is really important to realize is that data is really just there to, to give you an objective uh, look into what's actually happening, right? It, it's there to help you make better and more informed decisions. So if you can detach yourself from the data and just simply look at it like, okay, without making this mean anything about myself, what are the numbers telling me? What can I notice? What patterns is it showing me? And how can I utilize that information to make better decisions? I think that is going to help you go so much further in, in leading your business um, you know, from a financially sound uh, perspective. Right, awesome. Um, Stephanie Porter has her hand up. So Stephanie, you can unmute yourself and ask your question and then we go to the chat. Sorry about that, I, I apologize. Okay, it seems like she, she, she clicked the button without meaning to. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of interest in um, the affiliate marketing. Sure. Uh, you start talking about it. So essentially they just wanna know how they get started and how do they find out the information of who to work with and how to pitch themselves to do something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first I feel like I should offer a disclaimer that affiliate marketing is a great form of passive revenue, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that from today's um, session and immediately go, okay, I should spend all my time on, on building this arm of my business out because there are some people where their entire business model is literally to be an affiliate marketer. So they don't sell any of their own products and services. And all they do is sell other people's products and services. And that's great. But I'm assuming 99% of you here, that's not your business model. So instead of thinking of this as something to um, like, take the focus away from what your core bread and butter are. I just want you to think of this as something complementary that you can add slowly over time as it makes sense to. So with affiliate marketing, um, like I mentioned, the easiest platform that you can immediately become an affiliate for any product they sell practically is Amazon. I mean, it takes like few minutes to sign up and then you just have your own link so that anytime, for example, like I, let me give you an example of how you can start to build in affiliate opportunities without making it something that you have to, you know, relinquish other things in your business to focus on. So something that came, came naturally is, um, I host a live three-day challenge every few months where I teach, you know, experts, coaches, speakers, how to turn the knowledge in their head into an online course that they can sell over and over again. And inevitably through that challenge, you know, I'm teaching live and people notice, you know, that I'm using a microphone or they notice, you know, that 
my lighting is a certain way. And they might start asking questions naturally about like, Hey, what, you know, what ring light would you recommend? Or what microphone do you use? None of those things are, you know, the core bread and butter. I'm not a microphone expert, right? I'm not a podcast expert that I teach people those things, but because they ask those questions, I can create a piece of content around that. And I can say, Hey, here are the, here are my favorite tools that I use as an online business owner. And I can create that content one time, plug in my Amazon links. And that content is going to pay me over years of time as people are searching, like what microphone should I buy for blah, blah, blah. So that's like an easy way to just let things that are already happening in your business naturally create opportunities for you to build and passive revenue. So that's just with Amazon, but honestly, my biggest affiliate money does not come from Amazon because Amazon, as you can probably imagine, pays pennies on the dollars for any, anything that you recommend, like on a purchase, they might give you like 81 cents or like a dollar 50. So no one's getting rich off Amazon affiliate marketing, unless you have a website that gets literally tens of millions of people on it every single month. My biggest affiliate partners have actually been natural partnerships that developed out of me being a loyal customer and using a product that really makes a difference in my day-to-day business. So for example, one of my biggest affiliate partners is a software program called Kajabi. I became a customer of theirs in 2019 and they are the platform that I use to run pretty much everything in my online business, my website, my checkout cart, my sales pages, my courses, everything is hosted, my blog, everything's hosted there. So because I naturally already use it every single day in my business, it made sense to, you know, create content or to share about this platform. And what's beautiful about that relationship is most of the brands that you use, if you reach out to them and ask if they have an affiliate marketing, um, you know, program, a lot of brands do. They may not be very good at publicly promoting them, but a lot of the brands that you use on an everyday basis do have affiliate marketing programs. And so if you can just reach out and ask and get yourself signed up, find those organic moments to figure out how to tie it into your business. So, you know, Kajabi, for example, they're great because as a software company, they're paying a 30% recurring commission for every new customer you bring them in. So if you, if you, you know, refer one person to their software subscription, that person for the lifetime of that subscription, you're getting paid 30% of their monthly subscription. So I really like to look for recurring revenue streams because it allows you to leverage your time and get more impact and more income for the same amount of, um, energy and work. Wonderful. So in conclusion, um, uh, some people are asking for an, a, a link, an affiliate link for Kajabi. <laughs> yeah, Rochelle, I can definitely send it over. <laughs> um, so in, in conclusion, essentially, do, don't get out of your way and your personality and the goals of your business, just because this seems like a shiny object of recurring revenue. Exactly. Uh, focus first on what you want to offer and then allowed for those opportunities to kind of develop naturally. Mm-hmm. And that's just gonna make the process easier. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna go back up to the very beginning of your question so we can do some chronolo- chronologically asked ones over here. Sure. Um, how much of your budget do you spend on mentors or industry industry experts for personal and business development? And do you provide this for your employees? Yes, I do. So for my team members, I'm always encouraging them. A core value in our company is continual personal and professional growth. So I always encourage my team members, hey, if there's a specific Uh, topic or skill set that you feel interested in learning, bring it to me, like pitch what you want to, you know, to be a student in. And nine times out of 10, I say yes. And we, we invest those dollars into their training for me personally. I think, um, this answer has varied depending on the stage of my business. So way back in 2018, when I first started my business, my very first client paid me $300. That's literally all I had in my business bank account. I had just quit my job like two weeks before. Um, it was like Christmas time when I quit, I was 23. I really didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I knew I had $300. So for the income that I had, what felt like a risk, but also a reasonable risk for what I had at the time was to invest 
I think, oh my gosh, I think it was $47 a month in this online subscription, this online membership that taught you how to be um, a better social media manager, because that's the, the service I was providing at the time. So that was my very first investment. I'll always remember that because even though it was only, you know, 47 or $49 a month, it taught me early on to get in the practice of investing in myself, because I really, really believe that people who pay, pay attention, and you're going to be a lot more bought into whatever you do if you actually put money on the line. So that was my first investment, but over the years in depending on what's going on in our business and where we're spending money elsewhere, that can vary on a, on a quarterly or yearly basis. But I would say pretty consistently nowadays each year. I mean, we probably spend between 10 to $20,000 a year on ongoing investment in education and skills and training. And I have truly never had an investment in my life where I looked back and said that wasn't worth it because whether it was a specific skill or strategy that I learned from the educator themselves, or whether it was from the relationships I developed with my peers, I always tell people, people are your greatest assets in your business. There is nothing that will pay off in your business as much as the relationships you build with other people. So honestly, when I invest in myself, I don't always just look at what am I going to learn or what's like a tactical tip I'm going to get from investing in this. I look at if I invest in this, who am I going to be in the room with? Who am I going to meet? What kinds of relationships and connections am I going to build? How is this going to expand my network? And that kind of approach to self-development um, has always, always paid off. All right. Now, how much of your income should be profit for a business to be considered viable? I think this depends on industry, but curious to see. Yeah, that really depends on industry. Um, Cause I mean, there's no way you could compare something like what I do to like a, a restaurant or a retail business, right? Like the margins are just so vastly different. So uh, I, I would, I would consult with someone who works in your industry. Um, but the truth is viability is, subjective to your risk tolerance, right? Because I mean, if you're someone who has a huge risk tolerance or you have some sort of safety net, maybe you have a cushion of savings from your, from your previous job or whatever it is, you may be willing to go for months or even years without a profit, knowing that there's going to be a big payoff at the end. But for someone else with no cushion, no emergency fund, very low risk tolerance, um, you know, you might need a minimum of X percent profits just to be able to keep the lights on in your business and pay your personal bills. So it depends on a lot of factors, but I would not take any, even if you talk to an expert in your industry, I would not take their word as gold because I mean, if you even think about the biggest companies in the world, like I don't even think Amazon became profitable until like a few years ago. <laughs> I mean, they were decades in business at a loss, but no one would look at Amazon as a company and go, yeah, you're not a viable business. You should probably just cut the cord. Right. So you cut, you kind of have to think about it from the perspective of what other responsibilities do I have? What is my risk tolerance and what is the perceived payoff of what I'm actually building here? Because if you're building like a tech company, obviously most of the payoff comes at the end when you either get bought out or, you know, invested in by a huge firm. Whereas if you're a mom and pop retail store, that's not really the payoff. The payoff has to happen in the monthly, you know, cash flow that's coming into your business. Okay. Now this question is about when you're between when you're established and you're starting up. Um, can you talk a bit about the percentage change in the different spending categories? Um, or like where did you have that experience? Like you've spent an X amount, I don't know, 30% on X, Y, or Z when you were starting and now you do less or more. Yeah. So when I was first starting, I would say the first two, two and a half years of my business labor was a very low percentage of my spend. Whereas now it is the highest category in my company. Reason being when I was starting out, it was just me, right? Me, myself, and I. So I didn't really have to pay anyone else to do anything because I was doing all of it. That being said, one thing that I learned from my finance team that um, I wish I had known earlier is they, they taught me that even if you are the only person in your company, 
do not just count discount your labor as just free. Like, don't like look at your PL and go, oh, I spent 0% on labor this month because I didn't pay myself. And therefore like, it doesn't exist, right? Because you have to, if you're really treating your business like a business, you have to think about, okay, what is the role that I play in my business? And if you are, let's say the CEO and the director of marketing and your, I don't know, the, the director of operations at this point in your business, cause you wear all the hats, you have to think about, you still have to assign a value to your role, even if you don't actually pay yourself that value. So you may look at this and go, okay, if I got sick tomorrow and was hospitalized for six months, or if for some reason at some time I decided to sell my business or replace myself in the business, what would I reasonably have to pay someone to do the job that I do? And if it's, you know, 5,000 a month, 10,000 a month, 15,000 a month, whatever your reasonable salary or rate would be, you still have to account for that when you're budgeting and projecting, because even if you're not paying yourself that amount, you have to understand how that's impacting your profit margins in the long run. If you ever do decide to hire someone to replace you for a specific role. So, um, that's just something I would, I would consider, but the, the percentages that have fluctuated mostly for me has been labor over the years. That pie has grown a lot as I've, you know, hired on full-time team members and, you know, worked with contractors. Excellent. All right. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. When you made your initial business plan, how close were your projections to the reality? And is there anything you learned from that process that they can apply to their plan for a new business? Yeah. Okay. So you guys might not like this answer, but <laughs> I, d I did not have a business plan. Um, when I quit my job, like I said, I was 23. I did not actually plan to be an entrepreneur. My plan was to go you know, apply for another marketing job in Portland. Cause I was living in Corvallis at the time. And what happened is in the job searching process, I actually connected with a colleague at the company I'd left and him and his wife owned these local coffee stands. And they were like, Hey, while you're searching for a job, we heard you, you know, you're pretty good at Instagram marketing. Would you help us out? Can we pay you for this project? And so that was that $300 invoice that I was talking about. And that I understand does not work. That approach does not work for every type of business, especially if you're in a business with high overheads, right? I was in a service-based business where I was the sole, sole person doing the labor and my, my overhead costs starting out were close to zero. So it allowed me much more flexibility to, you know, try different things. You may not be in the same position and I totally understand that. So that's why I want to throw that piece of context out there. However, that being said, I do think that there is a point of, there's a difference between being prepared and informed and being overly, um, what is it? Overly cautious and overly planning, because I definitely think that there's a point that a lot of entrepreneurs reach where they spend all their time in spreadsheets, just trying to move little numbers around and being like, if I just had the perfect business plan, then I can get started. But the truth is, I think any of you who have been in business for even six months could probably relate to this. A lot of the clarity that comes in business comes through the action and actually doing the thing and having the experience. And we can plan, plan, plan all we want, but the truth is business very rarely goes exactly according to plan. So if you want to fast track your results and fast track your learning curve, the best thing to do is to actually just start, just start. Even if you're not a hundred percent clear on exactly what that plan looks like, because the data, as I mentioned, if you're tracking your numbers, if you're tracking what's actually happening in your business, data and experience are going to be your best teacher bar none. There's no amount of planning or textbooks or research that is going to give you as much clarity as the real time data that you receive that you can only receive if you actually put your offer out there and start selling something. Wonderful. Uh, here, uh, Robert mentioned that no business plan survives first contact with a customer. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, that's such a great way to put it. I totally, I totally agree. One of my all-time favorite quotes is um, by this poet. Um, I always butcher his last name, but his first name is Antonio. And the, the line goes, uh, traveler, there is no path. The path is made by walking. And I think that is one of my favorite all-time quotes in life because it's so true. We oftentimes try to map out every detail, every step, and we're looking for the path. But the truth is the path is actually made by our action. It's not the other way around. 
Oh, I'll say that again. <laughs> Traveler, there is no path. The path is made by walking. Awesome. So let, let's switch gears a little bit and let's give Angela the microphone so she can ask a question. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Ani. Um, really great talk, Ellen. Thank you. I have a, a quick question about the affiliate marketing is yeah. I feel like I'm doing like old school affiliate marketing. I record family histories for people. I'll video oh, do oral histories and then also video histories and they tell their story and then I hand that back to them with okay. pictures and, and such. And I have been giving workshops in retirement communities because mm -hmm. that's how I'm trying to attract my ideal client. Um, but what's happening is I give a little one sheet to the activities directors or the life enrichment directors that I work with that hire me to come in to give this memoir building workshop. Mm -hmm. And I, I give other services, like I can transfer VHS tapes. I can, um, scan all of your old photo albums, all of that stuff. And so mm -hmm. when I get those jobs, they are coming directly because the life enrichment director is handing this to their people who live in the retirement communities. So yeah. what I'm saying is they're not getting anything from me for that. So should I somehow compensate them for their mm. time and effort in leading me to these bits of income that I'm getting? Does that yeah. make sense? Yes, I totally get that. So you're you're thinking of like, should you be compensating them essentially as a referral partner for you, right? Exactly. Yes, yeah. that is my question. That is a great question. Um, there is no black or white, right or wrong answer as in mo with most things in business. Um, what I would consider is if there is a specific organization that has been a great referral partner for you. So they've brought in multiple clients to your business. I do think it could be worthwhile for you to, to approach that conversation and see if you actually built in a structured, um, payout where it's like, Hey, you know, I'll give you, I'm just making this up. Cause I don't know how much your services I'll give you a hundred dollars for every client that you send our way. Sometimes having an established referral process in place can actually open the doors for, um, you to ask, like, I've noticed you've already been a great referral partner organically, and you've sent me three clients. I'd love to, you know, amplify what's already working. What other ways can we work together to create opportunities to get this out in front of more people? Because I think that, you know, all families deserve to have their memories preserved or whatever it is. Right. Um, that's probably how I would approach the conversation. If you have a few key partners in mind that have been just extra supportive. Great. Thank you. I, I, you just gave me a couple really good ideas because oh, I can always, if, if they hit a particular dollar amount that I have received, then I can offer, um, a, a broader workshop. Wonderful. Cost, you know, that, that. that would be a little bit more. So it would feed them of their offering, uh, more value to the residents mm -hmm. because of knowing me. Okay. Thank you. I would yeah, of awesome. course. I would also just highly recommend since you're already doing these workshops in person, I'm assuming at oh, these yeah. retirement homes, maybe one time take the earnings from, you know, your next client and, and invest it into having someone, you know, record and video your workshop, because now you can package it as a digital workshop that you could sell internationally all over the world. Because I know there's millions and millions and millions of families that could probably benefit from what you do, but they just don't live in a local proximity to be aware of you. So, um, that, that could be another way better way actually to make passive revenue than, you know, through affiliate marketing. Yes, that is a fantastic idea. And then I'm actually set up to film my workshop, uh, in I think two weeks. And I ask it, is it okay if I go ahead and just set up my camera and just film the whole thing? Because what happens in these workshops is then people, we write a memoir and then we actually, everybody gets to share their story. Mm -hmm. And so I think I could do small clips to show that you actually, something actually does happen in this. It's not yeah. just talking. Awesome. Thanks, that. Ellen. Yeah, of course. All right. Thank you, Angela, for that question. My grandma wrote a memoir about a year before she passed away, and it is one of the most precious things. 
that we have. Um, how would you plan to deal with unexpected shortfalls like COVID or supply chain shocks? Hmm. Chokes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my experience is a little bit different than perhaps a lot of businesses just because with COVID, you know, the online business industry actually saw a spike in growth rather than a pullback. So I can't necessarily say that my experience during that time was the experience of the majority of business owners. And so, um, I would say though, in general, like there's a lot of things, right. That create fear in people in the economy, like recessions and inflation and all the things that happen, wars, all the things that happen in our world. And I think it's important, you know, to be mindful and to lead your business in an ethical way that feels aligned with your values during hard times. Um, but I also think it's important to remember that there will always be a clientele for different things, no matter how the general economy is performing, right? So if you think about it, there will always be people who in whatever financial setting are still spending like the, the great example that I can't remember what friend of mine showed me this one time. Um, but she, she, you know, Tiffany and co like the jeweler, the jeweler, like, uh, she went onto their website and she found this, it was like a joke, but she found a paper clip that they were selling for $500. I mean, it, it's a paper clip guys. And so I, I feel, I feel like it's important to bring this example up because you have to remember next time you think to yourself, there's no one that would be willing to pay for whatever it is that you offer. You have to remember there are literal, literal people out there that pay $500 for a paperclip. So keeping that in mind, it's important to remember that the world is so much more expansive than perhaps like the people around you. So even if the people around you are like, oh, like that's too expensive or like we're pulling back or we can't pay for that there's, there's people out there who will pay for your service or product. I guarantee it, no matter what the economy is like. Awesome. Um, Robert. Yeah, I just want to make, I just got to run, but I want to make one, one comment about this. Uh, Kat actually says, do businesses have savings accounts for rainy days? And I know in the middle of COVID, there was a lot of discussion about how businesses were running too thin and should have mm -hmm. been better prepared. And that is a, you know, that's a great dream, but the reality is business is competitive. And if you as a business owner are, you know, are increasing your margins so that you'll have more money to put aside, frankly, you're, you are, um, you're making it possible for other people to come in and, and, and underprice you. So mm. it's, um, it's, uh, yes, you want to build a good, you want to build equity in your business. You want to generate strength in your business over time. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't overdo it. I think you will find it difficult. Um, if you are in a competitive space, especially, you might find it difficult to compete if you are trying to just set a bunch of money aside and not use it to continue building your business. So just something to, something to think about and um, take care with. But I love Ellen. Ellen, I love your response to that question. Thank you. It's good know. seeing you. Um, Ro Robert has to um, log off, but we'll continue the conversation over here. Um, I'm going to pull up the poll because we are reaching the point where we log into the breakout rooms. And so I'm asking all of you guys, if you want to do the breakout activity, or if you want to continue to, to do a Q&A. Um, just, just as a reminder, the breakout activity is doing an audit of everything that you offer and the amount of time that it takes, the amount of revenue that it brings, and the amount of joy that it actually brings you. So this is something you guys can, I mean, when we do it on the breakout session, it's still something that um, you probably need to still sit down after, after today and, and really look at the numbers and, and look at the offers that are bringing you joy, are bringing you revenue, are bringing you profit. Uh, but I just wanna know what you guys want to do. Um, and in the meantime, I will ask another question. All right, somebody has 
content and has been building more to be able to do digital downloads, like spreadsheets and those kind of things. And it feels awkward and not honest to be upselling that content. How does she get over the hump? Um, and I, I'll just try, but how much should I have ready to go before launching? Okay, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question clearly. What, what makes you feel dishonest about selling a digital download? Um, Joe, you're welcome to unmute yourself so you can clarify this. Joe, are you there? Is this for me, Joe Bodro? question? Yes. Yeah, I think that I'm, was you. I'm sorry, I was not paying attention and I will admit that fully. What was the question? I got distracted <laughs> by an internal oh, conversation okay. here and um, I will admit I messed up. I apologize. Oh, it's all right. Um, well, you, you mentioned something that you have been preparing uh, digital content for digital downloads, but you feel that it's not... Um, you don't feel great about upselling that. So uh, Ellen asked you, what is it about it that makes you feel that it's not authentic or honest to do that? Well, I feel like I, because I'm a retail shop owner and I sell other people's products. And so I do have a line of things that I could make my own products, but I also feel like that that information and that energy is just helping building my clientele to continue shopping with me and not just something that I want them to pay for. So morally, I kind of feel awkward being like, yeah, give me $5 for this printout when it, I can, I already spent the time and energy to do it two years ago, three years ago or whatever. I have a b bunch of different oddball things, but then that's only supporting my current buyers and then charging somebody for it just seems a little awkward. And so I'd love to do that and get a little extra income. And are people really willing to pay five bucks? I would be, but then also if I've already been getting information for free and then now you're charging me five bucks, even if I just say, oh, it's just to cover the cost of printing, well, then I give me the digital download and I'll print it out myself. Like, why won't you give me this info? So, yeah. So I want to be there as a resource for people, but then also I don't want to charge people to be a resource and make it not myself and my business not worth going to. So I have a couple thoughts on what you shared. Um, first off, I think positioning any sort of small ticket item or, or download as like covering the cost of let's say printing or whatnot is not the right way to position the product because that's not the reason someone's buying it in the first place. Right. So the way I would challenge you to think about it is by offering this product or template or download or whatever it is that you're offering them, you are giving your customers, your existing customers, a better experience, right? Like that's the value, the convenience factor, right? And that has value to attach to it. And it, whether that's $5, $1 or $50, it, the dollar amount is not actually the important piece. It is what is, what is the saved time, the peace of mind, the better experience, the joy that the customer gets, the better use they get out of your products that you sell in your retail shop, all of that. If you increase that experience for them, in their mind, what is that worth to them in, in dollars? And for most of them, $5, yeah, that's probably worth it. And so I, I would really challenge you to think of not as you taking something away from a customer, but rather you adding to their experience and keeping in mind that just because something you invested time and energy in something years ago, doesn't mean it doesn't have value today, right? Because if you translate that to the real world, because sometimes I find that we get weird feelings about like digital things, but if you think about it in the physical world, right, I'm going to give you a really random example, but maybe it'll help. It would be the same thing as if someone 
I don't know, let's say created like a dog park. Right. And they're like, okay, five years ago, I like tilled this ground and we poured the concrete and we invested in this turf. And now five years later, maybe it's still that same turf and they haven't really done much to change it, but there's no way any of us would have the audacity to walk in and be like, you know what? We don't need to pay you actually, because you did this five years ago. So therefore I should get to use your services free forevermore. Right. We would never do that in the physical world. So the same concept has to apply to the value in digital products. Now, if you were to do that and you only had a small little egg basket of things, do you think making a plan to be able to have more content available later behooves you? Or do you think building up something and having a whole bunch of stuff ready to go and just egg? Start start with the one. Okay. Just start with the one. Yeah. Because you'll find the right opportunities, especially if you're using it as an upsell to enhance someone's customer experience, right? You'll know, like when it makes sense, if they buy a specific product or, you know, have a specific thing that you can say, Hey, by the way, I created something, a resource for you for $5 extra. That's going to allow you to X, Y, Z. Would you like to add it to your order today? Easy. Just start with the one and then build. Awesome. Thank you for Thank that, you. Helen. Yeah, I'm going to share the results of the poll so you guys see what your choice is. And it is uh, to continue with the Q&A. So mm-hmm. let's just do that. Yeah, um, more time with you guys. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here, when you say offers, how does that translate to a retail product? Let's say a clothing company. Uh, sorry, a what company? A clothing company. Oh, clothing company. Yeah. So I just say offer because that's like a term that we use in the online business world. But when I say offer, I truly just mean any thing, whether it's a digital product, a physical product or a service, any, anything that you sell. Um, so that's just what I mean by that. But did you have a particular question around the clothing? Um, I think they were just asking for clarification on oh. that. Um, yeah. So your SKUs, like your product SKUs, um, that would be your different offers, right? So if you carry like a hundred different items um, of clothing, you can you can look at it that way, or maybe you look at it in categories. Like maybe you're like, okay, I carry ten different brands in jeans, but jeans as a category is the highest performer in my shop. You want to pay attention to things like that because maybe you're using up retail space to showcase products that are not actually bringing you in the right revenue and growth. And maybe you could reallocate that space to your best sellers. Okay, um, Ellen, that was my question. Um, what, a, what I was, I'm um, Kat, <laughs> hi. Hi, I'm um, trying to find your face on this because it doesn't like highlight you. I'm like, where are you? Oh, anyway, that's continue. <laughs> um, my, my question was, um, you were saying that we should reduce the number of offers that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, to just the best sellers. But in the case of a clothing company, um, I feel like if I go onto a clothing website and I've only got say five, 10, 15 options or something, I feel like it's actually not, um, almost like it's not a viable clothing company in a way. Mm. Whereas if I'm going on to something like, um, say they're teaching classes or something, having five classes, I think that's fine. Yeah. So is is there something to understand that I don't sell clothing. I was just using that as an example. Yeah. yeah. To a little bit more on what you were saying about which offers you should prioritize. In that Absolutely. Context. Um, that's a great question, by the way, I think in, inevitably there, there will be advice that I share that may not be a hundred percent applicable to every industry. Right. And that's why I should have said that at the beginning. So thank you, by the way, for that reminder, I really, really believe in the value of context. And I, I encourage you to take this with you, no matter you know where you're learning or who you're learning from, always ask yourself, okay, is this person someone who has achieved the goal that I want to achieve in the industry that I want to achieve the goal in? And if not, what are the things that make sense and are applicable to me? And what can I let go of? So definitely always keep that in mind. But as far as what your question was about, I think in in the sense of like a clothing store, you're right. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't make sense for you to only have five SKUs, but what I would think about is visibility and attention and, and how you present what you're selling to your buyer does matter. So when you, when you, um, you know, land on like, let's say the homepage of an e-commerce shop or whatnot, if you have two bestsellers or three bestsellers, 
I would spend the majority of the real estate on that website, driving someone down a specific funnel to buy that best seller, because you know that if they buy that product in their first transaction, they're probably going to have an out of this world, amazing experience with that product because there's a reason it's a bestseller, right? And they're going to come back for more. So that doesn't mean that all the other products on your website have to disappear, but I would think about, am I overwhelming people with like 50 options on the homepage that they're scrolling through, or can I tailor their experience to help guide them towards, okay, I think you're going to love this thing. Let's start with this thing first and then see where we can lead you from there. Awesome. Great answer. And also just remember if somebody had told Levi's, you're, seriously, you're only going to sell blue jeans. You're mm. only going to sell denim pants. And that's pretty much all they do. They have other products, but that's pretty much yeah. been their focus since inception. So think about that. Like people start recognizing you because of this thing. And then from there, it can kind of trickle down into other things that you offer. But the main focus is their pants, right? Just a, just a food for thought over there. Honey, that's such a great example. And it reminds me too of, I know I keep using Amazon as an example today. I'm, I'm, it's not even like I love Amazon that much for some reason, it's just top of mind for business examples. But this reminds me of how, when Amazon first started, they weren't the, the global retailer that they are today. They only sold, if you guys remember, they only sold books, right? That was what they were known for. And, um, one thing you can look at when you look at huge behemoths, as well as small shops that have a lot of success. They, when you become known and really, really, really good at one particular thing, you'll find that the ripple effect of people buying from you for totally unrelated things increases exponentially. It was really interesting. Even and that applies to services too. Like when I was doing marketing, I remember when I got really niched down on a specific platform and not even just the platform, but a specific like element of that platform. I had the floodgates for inquiries from all over being like, can you do this LinkedIn thing? Can you run Google ads for me? Can you, all these things that I didn't even offer. It's interesting, this effect that when you become known as a leader or an expert in your space for a specific thing, it just makes everybody more attracted to you for all the other potential things that you could offer. Awesome. All right. Do you have a recommendation for a new business to track business numbers? Um, this person is considering QuickBooks, but they will prefer something less expensive if there are other options. Yeah. So we use QuickBooks as a company. Um, I started out with QuickBooks self-employed back in 2018. I think it was like $9.95 a month. Great, great use of my dollars did the job. Um, now my accounting team like runs everything through QuickBooks. So I don't know the, the ins and outs of exactly what they do, but um, I do know there is a company called Wave, uh, W-A-V-E, that offers free bookkeeping accounting services. Um, do it yourself, obviously, but their platform, their software is free. So that's another one you can look into. Great. And also Misty says yes. that she loves wave apps. Perfect. Misty is yeah. one of her mentors and she is part of the range ups program for that one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for you guys. And she can help you set that up as well as payroll and those kind of things. So if you are needing help in those areas, make sure you reach out to Misty. All right. Now, other question. This is, I like this one. Um, what was your marketing growth from year one to right now? And how did it evolve? Did you acquire more users or clients from marketing or, or sales staff? Like okay. what propelled that, that growth? Was it more clients? Was it your sales team? Was it your sales mm -hmm. tactics? That's a great question. Um, so the answer is not a simple one because our business model has evolved quite a bit over the last five years. So, um, starting out, I was a solo social media manager. So it was me going out, pitching clients and saying, Hey, I would love to manage your Instagram account. Here's what I can do for you. Here's the content. Here's the growth that I can create for you. So that was very, you know, kind of simple, direct selling one-to-one. -one. And, you know, as my client base grew and as I got results for people, I started getting a lot more word of mouth referrals, things like that. Um, that particular business model, we scaled to six figures in contracts 
in the first 12 months of business. So, and again, keeping in mind that was a higher ticket service, right? But I shifted primarily into digital products, online courses, online programs in late 2019, like very, very end of the year. Um, and what really blew that piece of my business up is definitely ads. So paid traffic through Instagram and Facebook. But as any of you who have been in my sessions before from past rounds, where we focused on marketing talk, um, ads are not a silver bullet. They are not a magic solution for your sales problems. So if you are not selling anything in your business currently, I don't want you to come away from this session and go, I just need to run ads. That is never, ever the solution. Um, ads in many ways is similar to money. You know, that old saying money doesn't change who you are. It just makes you more of what you already are kind of same idea for ads. Ads don't sell for you. They just amplify what's already working. They just get millions of more eyeballs on something that's already organically selling. So, um, ads made the biggest difference I would say from, uh, you know, 2020 through now. And then of course, just, um, bigger visibility opportunities through media. Um, our podcast has grown a lot since then. Um, speaking on stages, all of these things kind of have a flywheel effect. They all, you know, increase, um, how many people know about our brand and are buying from us. Wonderful. And now Rochelle, you have your hand up. Feel free to unmute yourself. Hi. Yeah. So I had created an online course. It's like a DIY pre-sale prep course for homeowners wanting to get their homes ready. And I had created um, some checklists and other things to go with it that I was trying to sell um, to make some revenue on my, off my website. But mm -hmm. what are there particular qualities of an online product that make it desirable? Or, I mean, I haven't sold any of them. <laughs> so yes. Just wondering. yes, 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 absolutely. By the way, if you want help with this, we have an upcoming live challenge. The one that I was telling you about where we help first-time course creators get paying students for their programs. Our next one is September 19th. So if you're interested in that, Rochelle, I can drop that link for you in the chat after. Um, but in general, what I would think about is um, products sell based on the transformation and how clearly you communicate that. So what most people do wrong when they sell online products, and when I say online, I mean digital information products specifically, is they try to convey value through um, volume of information. Like they will say things like, oh, you know, this course is $297 and you're going to get 25 modules and like 10 worksheets and these topics. And it's very um, features heavy, which we think as, and this is some, like a belief that I dismantle in my pay to create challenge, but um, we often think that the more information we offer someone, the more valuable something is to them. But in reality, people don't necessarily want more information. In fact, I think in our digital information age, they're overwhelmed by information. They rather want your perspective and your experience to be a filter or a shortcut for them to get to the result that they want in the most efficient path. So I would challenge you to look at your products and ask yourself, am I clearly calling out the person who would best benefit from these products? Am I being very specific about who they are in the circumstance that they're in? And am I very clearly conveying the outcome of what they will have achieve experience by the end of going through my program, because if that's not clear, that's a huge reason why it's not selling in my opinion. Awesome. Thank you. So because we are at nine 19 right now, we are going to continue to um, ask these questions, but I did want to share a few more things with you on the presentation slides that, um, you know, they're very quick. So don't worry. I'm not going to take up that much time with Ellen. Um, all right, so if you, um, Ellen has offered you guys, um, she has a worksheet where you can reverse engineer any income goals that you have. Um, if you do, you're welcome to DM their team on Instagram with the phrase money math, and then they will send you the link so that you can download that. Uh, I have seen this. I think we used that roadmap, didn't we, in the first Rainmaker um, 
And, and I thought that was very good because it sets a goal and a way for you to achieve it. At least gives you clarity in that process. So um, if you guys are interested in that, make sure you do that. And the next week we are going to talk about managing your cash flow. And we have Carla Titus uh, from Wealth and Worth Within. She is essentially a CFO for hire and she's also a corporate CFO, which I was just like, how does she do everything? But she does. Um, so she's going to bring us um, all of that financial knowledge in order to uh, manage cash flows. A lot of the times, that's not the only reason, but a lot of the times businesses fail is because there was an issue with their cash flow. So this is really, really important. Um, now, I'm saying, uh, again, this is not the only reason why a business would fail. It's not um, just like uh, bad management or whatever, but there are things that you can do in order to prepare for um, any kind of uh, challenges that come along the way. And if you haven't already, remember to join the Facebook group for Moneymaker. This is where we share all of the recordings and resources throughout. And in every single presentation, you guys have what you need to graduate as well as the link for your takeaway form. And I also include parts that have to do with RAIN and your virtual etiquette. Um, so if you guys ever wonder, aside from the emails that I send you guys, um, that is where everything leaves as well. And with that, we can go to the next section. The, the next question, I mean. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did I stop sharing my screen now? I think I did. Uh, what? Oh, this is an interesting question. What compelled you to leave your corporate job, Ellen? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, a number of things. I okay. So it's interesting because I think a lot of people leave jobs because they hate everything about their situation, right? Like maybe they hate their boss, they hate their coworkers, they hate the work they do, the pay, whatever it is. I found myself in an interesting position because I actually really loved my coworkers. Like I loved the people I worked with. My job to me was boring, but it wasn't like the end of the world. Right. Um, and my boss was okay. I, I think what I realized though, was it didn't, it didn't fulfill me and I didn't feel challenged, um, in that position. And I didn't see staying there longer as a means for changing that situation. I didn't think like if I stayed there for an extra year, two years, five years, that that was going to really change anything about that particular situation. And so, um, knowing that I didn't want to just stay complacent in that role because it felt comfortable. So I just, I quit, like I quit after 10 months and that was a big no, no. I remember from like everyone telling me like, you're making a mistake, you know, you're, you have a stable job, you should stay with it, all these things. Um, but I really believe that sometimes when you, your gut knows that you're not in the right place, um, depending again on your risk tolerance and, and all that, it, it just made sense for me at the time. I knew that, you know, I had the lowest amount of responsibility that I would probably ever have in my life at that age. So I didn't have a whole lot to lose by, you know, trying something else. So essentially it was your gut, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm a very, it's interesting. If you know me in real life, I'm a very, very impulsive decision maker when it comes to huge decisions. I will like, once I decide something, it's like, I'm just doing it. And it's, it's huge leaps and bounds, but for little micro decisions, like, what do you want to order at the restaurant? I am like the most indecisive person. So I apologize if we ever go to a meal together and I'm always the last one to order. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, it's kind of a good trade though, you know, like if you can yeah. make important decisions like that, then that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. How much time should somebody allocate per week for business management? So this person is a creative and is struggling to set aside the time for business. Um, so, um, what, I mean, there's, I just want to make sure I understand what do you define as business management? Are you talking about all admin things? Are you talking about marketing your own business? Are you talking just about financials? Um, whoever asked this question, you are welcome to unmute yourself to clarify this. Hi, it was me that asked. Um, Hi. Any, I'm a, I'm a hairdresser. I love doing hair. Any, so it will be anything that's not behind the chair. Got or, it in the salon, paperwork, marketing, all of it. 
Mm, okay. That's a great question. Um, like all of my answers, it depends. It depends on, um, you know, your working hours, your schedule, um, and how, and how you best, um, like your best workflow. But I would say that it's important that, um, I would say at least once a week, you should be checking in on those other aspects of your business, because those things are what keeps the clients coming through the door and in your chair to allow you to best serve them. Right. So, um, I find that sometimes it helps to just block out a specific time, um, in the week where it's like, it's your time to work on the business rather than in the business and allowing yourself that, that space and saying, I don't take client appointments on this day during this time window, or like maybe you you even block off an entire day of your week where you don't accept clients because that's your me time to work on your business, not to serve your clients. So, um, I don't know if that helps. I know it's a little bit of generalized, but it's hard to give you a specific recommendation without knowing the ins and outs of your business. No, that, I think that's a great answer. I mean, you, you have to set up your boundaries and you have to be clear of what works in your business, right? If it doesn't work for you, it's not going to work for your business. So you, it needs your business. So again, make decisions that are aligned with who you are, with what you need, because otherwise you're going to go crazy, like kind of trying to manage all the things without uh, acknowledging what your limits are. And it's not bad to have boundaries or to ha- recognize what your own limits are. Um, that's, that's only human. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Um, I think that we have reached it. You guys? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Somebody here, but I think this was uh, more of a suggestion for somebody about uh, if they have considered taking the social media courses offered by platforms themselves, mm-hmm. for example, like meta courses for Facebook and Instagram um, or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that those courses are great resources, um, especially if you don't have a basic understanding of the platform and you really want to fully leverage all of the features that are available to you. Um, I I say there's no harm in it. Um, but I find that those type of courses offered by the platforms themselves very rarely are strategy focused. They're more so, uh, utility focused, right? Like showing you, this is how you set something up, or this is how you post this type of content. And they're, they're showcasing their different features, which is helpful. Don't get me wrong. But if you're looking for deeper strategy, you're typically not all the time, but you're typically not going to find it in those um, free programs that are offered by the platforms themselves. Oh, so I just discovered another question here on the chat. At what stage in your business, uh, when you were doing everything yourself, did you start transitioning from free products to paid options? Um, well, I, I don't think I ever actually offered like only free products from day one, you know, um, as a social media manager, I was charging for my services. Um, I, I mean, I, I do offer certain free resources, for example, like we spend a lot of time and energy and money on producing our podcast cubicle to CEO, where we bring you case study interviews with leading CEOs and entrepreneurs across all different industries. And each of them come on our show and share one specific strategy each week that grew their business revenue. So you can essentially copy their homework and borrow that strategy. Um, so, you know, we do create free resources like our podcast, but there was not like a definitive point where I was like, I was only offering free things. And then I transitioned into paid things. I was always doing both simultaneously. All right. I think this question was related to like tools that you use that were free versus paid. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, thank you for clarifying. Um, I, for digital products in specific, since you, since you were asking about Kajabi, um, my very first launch of my very first program, I actually, so I, I teach a pre-sell method, meaning for example, like in my paid to create challenge, we 
teach you how to enroll paying students in your online course or digital product before you even create the product. So it's a way of validating the idea in the marketplace, getting cash injection in upfront, and then using that to fund your expenses. So when I first sold my product, I pre-sold it to 10 students before I had ever created any of the lesson content. And that I literally used all free tools. Like I had, you know, I did the free zoom account. I had a free Facebook group. I charge people through a free PayPal invoice. I mean, obviously I had to pay the, you know, processing fees, but aside from that, but right after my beta group, um, the, the funds that I got for my beta group, that's when I invested in Kajabi to host my future programs, my checkout cart, my sales pages, my website, everything in that one ecosystem. Wonderful. That's great. All right. So we're on top of the hour. Um, thank you, Ellen, once again, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, there are some great comments on the chat about you. Uh, so if you ever want to use those as testimonials, uh, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Once again, I don't know if you have any last remarks you would like to share with our group today. Can yeah. I, can um, I make one comment? Oh yeah, of course. I think Ellen, you have. You know, what I liked is, uh, you know, you have the right attitude, right energy. I really appreciate it. There are two things that I learned, if not anything. One is travelers, there is no path. Paths are made by walking. <laughs> I love that. And then, of, and then, of course, money doesn't change you. It only magnifies uh, who you really are. So I, you're smart, you're articulate, and, and we are, really enjoyed your presentation. Wow, thank you. I mean, your words mean the world. I, I really appreciate just the time I get to spend with you all today. And um, as Ani mentioned uh, earlier, if you guys want additional resources, we'd love to help you as much as we can. Um, so if you want that 10K month uh, money roadmap, just again, Instagram, go to Instagram, go to cubicle to CEO, DM us the, the phrase money math, and my team will send that link over to you. Um, our podcast, Cubicle to CEO, you can listen on Apple, Spotify. If you want continual free resources, especially to grow your financial literacy, that's a great resource for you guys to tune in weekly to. Um, and Ani, can I, am I allowed to share my event tomorrow in case anyone local wants to come down? Yes. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm hosting a, an event. Let's get visible. Um, we're, I'm flying in four of my friends who are visibility and marketing experts in different areas. And we're hosting a live expert panel on how to get your business and brand more seen um, through media, SEO, paid traffic, all the things, uh, dinner and a drink are included with your ticket. It's primarily an event for women, but of course, if you want to show up and you're a guy, you, know, you might be in the minority, but we'd love to have you. Um, and so if you want the link for that, it's in independence, which is, uh, like 20 minutes outside of Salem at gorgeous riverfront hotel. So, um, the link for that, I will drop in the chat. It's ellenyan.com slash let's dash get dash visible. We still have a few tickets left and I'd love to see some of you in person. Awesome. That's wonderful. Um, all right. So with that, we have reached the end of this wonderful session. Um, guys, if you have any questions or any concerns about the program, about any of the sessions that we have seen so far or that we are going to see, you're always welcome to email me. And I hope you have a great Wednesday and we will see you next week. Remember, there is no mentor hour this week. And thank you, Ellen, again for coming today. Mm -hmm.